that we have on the field slot here, which is the uh, object detection. We found this uh, image net on screen data set, but we have learned a lot from there. And you can see that from the progress uh, through these just the two years, um, or three years actually. So we almost doubled the performance for three times on this uh, benchmark data set. It is truly amazing. And uh, advertisement is like, this number is fine, <laughs> but now this number is 60, 62. So the field has been really um, grew up a lot. And uh, I also agree that video action, robotics is uh, very important. That's why we have the video detection this year, which is an intermediate step between you know, detecting this um, building blocks uh, from the robotics stuff. Um, so we expect more progress um, to appear. Um, so for, for those who are not quite familiar with detection task for the image net, um, so in one image, you detect all the possible objects in the image. Um, and actually, it's uh, just uh, like a 200 object categories defined in the image net. Of course, I think um, we need to develop, um, detect everything, but I believe that you know, everything developed on this data set can be also transferred to some broader application. Um, and uh, for the evaluation, we use uh, the, um, followed by the Pascal VOC standard, that's computer MAP. Uh, so basically for each category, on um, each image you compute the overlap between your prediction and the uh, ground choose. If the overlap threshold is larger than, say for example 0 0.5, then it's a crack. And then you compute AP for across all image and uh, compute the mean across all classes. This year we um, training image and validation are all the same, but we add a few um, test image. And I, I will briefly talk about how we collect this uh, data set just, um, so that um, you know, um, how we do this. So first we use some um, 129 manually created um, queries and we query image from Twitter. Um, so you got a lot of those uh, same level categories. And then you have to uh, know what kind of categories is in the image. Because um, the image net, you have a hierarchical structure of your class. So, and also the label in the image is very sparse. So if you want to label every, um, every 200 categories, it's very, um, very extensive. So if we use the hierarchical structure of the label, um, label space to speed up the labeling process. So in specifics, suppose you have uh, a lot of image, and then you want to decide what object is in the image. Then you first do, is there an animal? So if there's not, then probably a lot of this image you don't need to consider anymore. And then the second step is, is there a mammal? There's a subcategories of animal, and then you also pull out some image, and then eventually maybe you come down to a leaf node in the detection task. You ask, is there a cat? Okay, so I find the cat here. And then the first step is to identify the class appeared in the object. And then after we know the um, class in the image, we annotate the box. And we also, um, this is a paper published by how to and etc. So if we image, we know the label of the image. So for each image in the class pair, we draw funding box, one funding box at a time. So you draw a box, and then you ask another person to verify it. if the box is good or not. If not, then you draw again. And then if the box is good, then you ask another person to say, is all, um, are all objects being annotated or not? If not, then you draw again. Um, so this process is repeated several times until all the objects in the image are annotated. And here are some of the um, annotated image uh, that show. Um, yeah. And uh, here is, um, so in the 2015, we have a, um, have a lot of teams participate in the challenge and also together with MS Coco, and we can talk about that later. Um, but here are the few teams which has a better, um, actually like the, all these teams have better performance than last year's best results. So we can say like, you know, it's, again, it's a great achievement um, from the whole community. And the winner of the track with provided data is again it's um, MSIA team and the team member is Kai Ying He 
，项羽当少卿人见孙。From Microsoft, and the round up is our program research is Daniel Fontic, um, Paul Inventorson, Iran Shogo, Blaise Togo, Antonio Sarra, and Kai Snow. Um, let's congratulate two teams. Challenge involved detection and segmentation. 
And here uh, on the bottom, I've shown what exactly we're talking about the differences. So detection would be where you're making the bounding box a decision, and segmentation where you're making a, a full um, estimation of the instant segmentation. So once the competitors have submitted, have designed their algorithm, they've used our training set, uh, and now they want to see how they could possibly, uh, how they would compete in this um, challenge. So what they would do is they would download one of our test sets, and I'd like to go over how we made test sets available to competitors. So the full MS Coco test set contained 80,000 images. Of these 80,000 images, we broke them down into four uh, independent sets of 20,000 images. The first test set we called Test Dev for development. This was for debugging and validating code, and how the competitors would use this is they would be able to upload their solutions to our evaluation server as many times as they wanted to see how they, they performed on this debugging test set. Then there was a standard test set, and this was used for a public leaderboard. Um, there was a limited number of submissions, five submissions to our uh, evaluation server, but this was what we uh, wanted to make available to competitors if they wanted to publish archive, if they wanted to compare to um, other teams that were publishing about their results, um, but it was, in order to possibly limit overfitting, um, we were only allowed five uh, submissions, five attempts at this. And then we had a challenge test set, which the competitors were never able to see in advance. We will be telling you what their results were on this challenge test set, but the competitors themselves did not know what their results were on this test set. Um, as an extra, uh, an extra measure in um, understanding the relationship between how one competitor's algorithms worked or another competitor's algorithms worked, or trying to understand if there was overfitting or, or any other kind of strange behavior, we had a reserved test set um, that uh, the scores won't be made public, um, and uh, none of the um, images or those on these images will be released, uh, but we will be able to tell you whether or not um, the scores differ between challenge test set and the reserved test set in order to uh, estimate overfit. So finally, um, after uh, the teams designed their algorithms, uploaded their results, um, we evaluated their uh, submissions using a variety of different scores. And I'm going to quickly go through the scores. Um, if you looked at our uh, MS Coco Challenge website, you probably saw this big table, a lot of things coming out. Um, our first uh, score was the MS Coco Challenge AP score, which is the uh, mean average precision from uh, intersection over union of the bounding boxes between 0.5 and 9.5. To kind of give you an illustration of what that looks like, um, we're showing here an IOU of 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0 0.9. So to get uh, a good idea of a more robust measurement, we um, averaged uh, the AP of um, these different bound box overlaps. Um, we also scored the uh, AP at different sizes of object instances. As many of you who have tried to participate in challenges like this or who have done detection in the real world, smaller objects may be more difficult, especially in the Coco data set where they may be more blurry or they might be slightly obscured. Um, smaller images or medium-sized images might be more difficult than large images. And as a result, we wanted to characterize that behavior uh, in different competitors. So um, we have an AP score. We'll be comparing our competitors with AP scores evaluated at only the smallest object instances, the medium-sized object instances, and the large-sized objects. Object uh, we also calculated average recall. We did that over uh, different numbers of detections, 1, 10, 100 detections. And we did average recall over the different sizes that I just showed you, small, medium, and large. Uh, now, I'm sure that you're very excited to see uh, what the results were like, so I'm going to pass it out to my colleague, Mateo. Thank you. Um, so yes, let's uh, take a look at the challenge results and a little bit of analysis on them and what we can gain from them. So first of all, uh, as Jen said, we have four splits and we wanted to make sure that, sorry guys, we wanted to make sure that teams were not overfitting on uh, any of the splits. And also another thing is that we want to make sure that the statistics in the splits are the same across them and no split is easier than any other one. So as you can see here, we compare for all possible combinations um, of uh, uh, test sets, and we measured the average AP deviation across all teams, 
the mass deviation and the standard deviation of the AP deviations. And as you can see, it's very small numbers across the whole table. So this is useful for us because we're going to use some of the results on the test step to compare with uh, results on the challenge, especially for our baseline methods. And also because it's a confirmation that no flags are raised about the fact that one split is easier than any other. Uh, let's now focus on the challenge versus reserve splits, with our, which are the ones that we use for the workshop and to score the teams in our challenges. So, if we take a look at the average performance deviation across all 12 metrics that Jen introduced, uh, for all teams, we can see that the value uh, of the absolute deviation is less than 2 times 10 to the minus 3 between challenge and reserve. And so yet again, this confirms that teams are not overfitting on one test split uh, with respect to the other one. Um, so let's take a look at the detection bounding box uh, leaderboard. Uh, and if we look at the AP scored average at all the IOUs, we can see where our uh, baseline fast RCNN, uh, you can find code available at uh, the GitHub page of uh, Ross Gershnik, uh scores. And then we can see that compared to seven entries in our workshop, this really um, shows the difference between the methods that were able to get more than 20% and the methods that were able to get less than 20%. And then we can take a look at the top three methods, uh, which are uh, Microsoft, Facebook, and IM team which all go above 30%. Uh, the uh, difference between our baseline and our winning method is a almost 9% relative increase in this metric. So it shows that uh, there was a lot of improvement going on in this, uh, in this competition. And so that is very exciting for us. Um, similarly, we can look at the implementation of the challenge. And at the leaderboard, we had only three entries, and we encouraged people to participate in the next segmentation challenges that's very exciting for us as COCO team. Um, and so for the three entries, you can see that the first entry has slightly below 20%, and then again, the second and first entry go above 20% and almost reach 30. And uh, it's interesting to note that segmentation winners have an AP that is about 10% lower than the AP that detection winners are able to achieve. And so this gives us two intuitions. The first one is that algorithms are detecting the objects but not exactly localizing them. And then another insight is that obviously drawing an exact boundary is a little bit harder than simple localization of the object. Another graph in which we can see this is if we take a look at uh, the AP metric, that is the standard metric that has been used in Pascal and also in the ImageNet competition. So you see that there's a bounce to almost 60% AP uh, for the top team. And if we compare this to the AP75, we see that there's almost a 20% gap. And this gap is characterized by the objects that are correctly detected, but not perfectly localized. And so there's a lot more that we can do, and that is very exciting, uh, again, to observe. Um, so the idea is that uh, explaining how well the localization is of an object is a task that can be hard also for us humans. So if you look at these three images and the detection bounding boxes, you can get an idea that the one on the left is really the worst one, uh, but it's really hard to quantify, even if you uh, are given the ground truth bounding boxes. And even if you're given the values of the IOU of these detections, it's really hard to say exactly if uh, that actually matches uh, the expectation that you would have of those numbers. So we, we can make a little bit more to found, find the metric that really helps us uh, understand better. And that's why we averaged over all the values of possible penalty. Uh, finally, let's go and uh, do a little performance breakdown and analyze all the dimensions uh, that our data set and our metrics and our evaluation codes allow us to <coughs> So if we look at the AP variation across super categories and size, so um, as Jen said, uh, we have instances of different sizes and our metrics allow us to analyze the performance over them. And we also have 12 super categories uh, in which the object categories are organized. And you can see here a plot uh, in which we, lift, we list the average performance across teams and deviations uh, over all the uh, super categories. And so you can see that the range goes from the easier categories Super categories such as animal, uh, where probably images are, of animals are taken in a very standard way, um, centered and usually with not a lot of clutter, to uh, the hardest super category, which is accessory, 
such as forks and spoons that you can imagine are very small in images and usually appear with a lot of clutter. And this is also confirmed if we take a look at this other plot, uh, which shows for all 12 super categories, the performance going from small to medium to large instances. Uh, and the idea is that the slope of this line tells us how much uh, increasing size helps the recognition of objects in that super category. And the intercept, or the height of this line, tells us how easy, on average, that uh, object uh, uh, super category is. And so you can see that, for instance, uh, the accessory plot is really lower than all the other plots. And if you look at the sport in the last row at the third column, you can see that going from medium to large actually might hurt performance. Um, to get a little deeper understanding, we showed uh, this relationship for some interesting object classes, uh, which we show here. And if you take a look at baseball bat and skis, which are in the sports super category, you see again the same trend that going to large instances seems to hurt recognition. Uh, the idea might be that there are not a lot of uh, examples that are very large, and also that when you go so large for certain objects, you might lose uh, context and you might lose a little bit of the visual features that instead characterize your object. Uh, at smaller sizes. So if we uh, plot, uh, if we plot for all 80 categories, um, the AP versus the slope of that line, we can see that there's a clear trend. On the y-axis, we have objects for which size helps recognition, and on the x-axis, we have objects that are easier to recognize. And so there seems to be a pretty strong linear correlation. Uh, and so this, again, tells us something interesting about our data set and how teams perform. Uh, some examples are baseball bat in the lower left corner and at the opposite end of the spectrum of bear, so that's encouraging. If, if there's a bear somewhere, like we're gonna be able to you know, you know, automatically find that we're in danger. Uh, or a stop sign, and a person instead is kind of middle of the pack, but has the behavior that you would expect in which going from small to large uh, recognition increases and uh, the deviation is very small across all teams, so that means that uh, teams in general did very similar on the person. Um, let's now make a, a type of analysis that is also going to tell us how good the algorithms are doing specifically. So, what we did is that we uh, did some sort of uh, uh, error analysis on the um, detectors inspired by Derek Rayem and the code was implemented by Pewter. A dollar and is available at his GitHub page. So here, over uh, there's three terms. The first one is overall, um, and so that means it's uh, overall categories. All again is a super category, and all this, the third all is the all size uh, of the instances. You can see performance of the winning team, uh, and so these are really precision recall curves um, at, uh, con that consider different um, parameters. So the first two are the precision, the standard precision recall curves that you would observe for uh, IOU at 0.5, which is the one that is in the higher uh, right corner because it's uh, uh, easier to recognize at 0.5 IOU, and the smaller one with less performance is the IOU at 0.75, and the area under these uh, precision recall curves is the number that you see in the small legend and is the number that you would have found in our uh, leaderboard. And so the idea is that if you remove localization errors, then you obtain the blue precision recall curve. Uh, and the way that we did it is by fixing the IOU to the back of 0.1. And again, if you uh, remove false positives that are caused by uh, errors within the same super category, so if you mistakenly say that a frisbee is a soccer ball, but you don't count those errors, you're going to gain a little bit in your precision recall curve and go to the very end of the red part. Similarly, if you remove all uh, category um, information, you're going to go to the green one. And so you can see that MSRA is not doing a lot of uh, errors in which one instance is classified as, a, as another object. Uh, but most of the errors come from background false positives. And finally, if you remove the false negatives, you obtain the perfect precision recall curve in the top right corner. Um, so once we have this analysis, we can go and look at what happens for some specific uh, object uh, instances. And so we saw that skis has a, a, a very particular uh, performance in which it seems that going to large instances, something happens. And we can definitely see this in, in these plots. And so you can see that going from small to medium for skis, 
you really lose all the false negatives. So it means that you actually find all the the skis that 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 are there, and also the uh, IOU at 0 0.5 and 0 0.75 increases a lot. But when you take that step towards large skis, it seems that the whole thing fails. And I mean, this is not really um, very uh, you, like you can see that how the precision recall curves get very discontinuous, and so this shows that there's not a lot of examples of that type. Uh, for another object uh, such as book, which was very hard across. Uh, all sizes, you can see a similar trend and for instance you see that most of the errors in books are not due to localization but are really due to the background false positives that are uh, assigned. So that means that these algorithms tend to see books everywhere and, and you're going to see examples of this later. So finally uh, another interesting analysis is um, how similarly do algorithms make mistakes? So if we use the same plots and we compare the top three entries on the class person, you can see that behaviors are pretty similar. It's interesting to see how Ayun, which was the uh, third best algorithm, has very small false negatives, uh, or smaller false negatives than the top two entries. But you can see that there's a very similar train, and so it seems that at least the top three algorithms perform very similarly on the person category. Uh, Another intuition is that not only algorithms make the same mistakes, but they also perform similarly. And so we compared Microsoft, uh, Asia, and Fair CNN uh, for all object categories. And you can see that there seems to be a very high correlation. Uh, and the other intuition that you can get from this plot is that, yes, we did use one single metric to determine our challenge winner, but our metric is a pretty good summarization, because as you can see across all object categories, Microsoft is better than uh, uh, Facebook. And, uh, <laughs> 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 it might have come out a little awkward. I <laughs> and I hope Microsoft is still considering me uh, to apply it. <laughs> Anyways, uh, and then if we uh, compare Microsoft uh, against um, the Team 1026, we can see that again there is even a bigger uh, jump and. Uh, no category is actually done better than the Team 1026 with respect to Microsoft, whereas uh, Fair CNN had a few examples in which it was actually doing better. And it seems like the correlation is still high, but a little bit lower. Uh, so finally, let's go and see some success cases. Um, results are from uh, the Facebook team, so a big shout out to them. Uh, this is incredibly good. Uh, you can see that the second, this is not ground truth. This is actually the uh, results of the segmentation. And you see that they're really remarkable and the sheets are uh, almost all correctly uh, separated one from each other. You can see there's a small mistake in which the sheet in the center is split in half, but still this is incredible. And uh, again, if you compare this to ground truth, it seems like we're actually doing better. Uh, so, <laughs> so, uh, and here they're side to side, so. We don't need ground truth anymore. Is that possible? Um, and then another pretty good example is this one, in, in which it's a scene with a lot of clutter and a lot of different um, objects. And I mean, there is a mistake because uh, that's clearly not a frisbee. But I mean, frisbees are round and they can be on the ground. So who are we to, to say that that's not a frisbee? Uh, and, and finally, another very interesting one in which all the cars in the back are correctly uh, segmented, even though they're very small. Uh, and yes, there is again a skateboard that is not really there, but skateboards usually are there, and uh, kites and umbrellas usually are above people, so that's also another pretty reasonable uh, mistake. But you can see there's a book uh, on the very top of the building, and so that is Again, what I was telling you uh, previously that uh, these algorithms tend to see books uh, in a lot of places. Uh, there are some failures. Uh, this is an example. Again, look at the elephant. There's three uh, independent parts that are classified as uh, elephant and segmented as elephant. So it seems like one possible direction can be uh, towards uh, being able to combine uh, uh, parts that belong to the same object in a better way. And here again, books all over the sky, <laughs> and benches and chairs. But, but again, this is very difficult because some of those objects do seem to have similar visual features to what a chair or a bench could have.
And then again, this is another fair case in which uh, the zebra seems to not be segmented perfectly, and also there's sheets instead of rocks. Uh, so it's really impressive. <laughs> and so finally, we have the channel ranking. Um, and uh, so third place for segmentation, we have team 1026. And then fifth and fourth for the bottom box, we have the University of Highlighted and Carnegie Mellon University TA2. Um, and then I am in third place for bottom box, Facebook in second place for both challenges, and our winner, uh, Microsoft Asia. So a big round of applause for that.